Welcome and thank you for tuning in to Let's Heal Together. This is Series 2, Caregiver Chronicles Unveiled, and I'm your host, Doc Steph. This is Episode 3, Addressing Compassion Fatigue. We will dive into the challenges faced by caregivers and provide valuable support and solutions to alleviate our burden and explore the topic of compassion fatigue in caregiving, shedding light on its impact and offering strategies to navigate this complex issue. Join us as we embark on this journey of understanding, healing, and empowerment for caregivers. Caregiving is incredibly demanding and selfless, often requiring us to provide care and support to loved ones facing physical or mental health challenges. As caregivers, we dedicate ourselves to the well-being of others. We can sometimes neglect our own emotional and physical needs, <clears throat> leading to a phenomenon known as compassion fatigue. To start our discussion, let's begin by understanding compassion fatigue and how it affects us. Then explore the signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue and its potential impact on our well-being. So understanding compassion fatigue, um, it is a state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion that often when we are exposed to prolonged stress and empathy or the suffering and trauma of those we care for. It often results from the constant demand of providing care without sufficient time to recharge and take care of ourselves. It can also be experienced by healthcare providers, social workers, counselors, therapists, emergency responders, and family care caregivers. Compassion fatigue differs from burnout. So we don't want you to get confused with the two. Symptoms are a little similar, but they're, you know, you know, they share um, some similarities, but have distinct concepts. Understanding their differences can help caregivers and professionals identify and address the specific challenges they may be facing. Burnout is generally characterized by exhaustion, cynicism, and detachment from work, whereas compassion fatigue refers to the emotional and physical strain from caring for others in distress. Let me give you a breakdown of compassion fatigue and burnout. For, um, for <clears throat> again, compassion fatigue refers to the emotional and physical exhaustion that arises from caring for others suffering or in distress. It typically occurs in professions or roles involving direct care, such as healthcare providers, social workers, therapists, and first responders. Here are some key characteristics of compassion fatigue. Um, let's start with um, A, compassion Fatigue focuses on the caregiver's emotional engagement and empathy toward those they care for. It can develop rapidly or gradually, often due to repeated exposure to traumatic or stressful situations. You may feel emotionally overwhelmed, numb, or detached. Sometimes, struggle to connect with others or experience empathy it can affect your ability to provide quality care and may result in decreased job satisfaction, increased errors or mistakes, and a sense of diminished purpose. We can often recover from compassion fatigue and regain our emotional strength and empathy with proper self-care, support, and strategies. Now B, on the other hand, burnout is a state of chronic fatigue, emotional and mental exhaustion that arises from prolonged stress and work-related factors. It can occur in various professions and job roles, not limited to caregiving roles. Burnout is generally associated with work-related stress, including workload, organizational dynamics, and job dissatisfaction. It tends to develop gradually over time, 
often due to prolonged exposure to high stress levels. Individuals may feel emotionally drained, cynical, and detached from their work or the people they serve. They may develop a hostile or indifferent attitude towards their responsibilities. Burnout can have broader implications beyond the caregiver role and affect various aspects of a person's life, including personal relationships and overall well-being. Recovering from burnout often requires significant changes in the work environment, workload management, and self-care practices. It may involve reassessing career goals, seeking support, and implementing strategies to restore work-life balances. While both compassion and fatigue and burnout involve exhaustion and emotional strain, the key distinction lies in their focus and triggers. Compassion fatigue primarily revolves around the caregiver's empathetic responses to others' suffering, while burnout is a more general state of chronic exhaustion resulting from work-related stressors. Recognizing whether one is experiencing compassion fatigue or burnout can help tailor um, appropriate interventions and support systems. Let me give you an example of compassion fatigue. Imagine you are a dedicated firefighter working tirelessly to extinguish fires and save lives. You rush into burning buildings, confront dangerous situations, and witness the devastation firsthand. Each time you save someone or see a tragedy, you pour your heart and soul into your work. Driven by compassion, and a deep sense of, step, of, of duty. However, over time, the constant exposure to trauma and the weight of responsibility take their toll. Your body and mind become weary from the physical demands, the emotional strain, and the ongoing cycle of crises. You start to feel the effect effect of exhaustion creeping in both physically and emotionally. Like a firefighter experiencing compassion fatigue, your energy reserves gradually deplete and you find it increasingly challenging to maintain the same level of empathy and engagement. The intense emotions you once felt fade, replaced by numbness or detachment. Your motivation wanes, and even the most minor tasks can feel overwhelming. Just as a firefighter need regular breaks, rest, and support to replenish their physical and emotional strength, caregivers also require similar care. Without taking time to recharge and prioritize our well-being, caregivers may grapple with compassion fatigue a state where their ability to provide compassionate care is compromised. Just as fire, fighter fire, firefighters sorry, must balance their dedication to, seeing, to saving lives with self-care, caregivers must also balance their compassion for others with self-compassion and self-care. By implementing strategies to address it, caregivers can continue providing effective care while safeguarding guarding you know, their own well-being. It is important to note that compassion fatigue is not a sign of weakness or a lack of empathy. It is a natural response to continuous exposure to emotional and psychological stressors. Recognizing the symptoms of compassion fatigue is crucial for for us to address our well-being and continue providing adequate care. Adequate, mm, adequate care. So let's talk about recognizing the signs and the symptoms. We, it's an absolute must that you know we recognize the signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue within ourselves. We will discuss how caregivers can identify these signs and symptoms and d- differentiate them from regular stress or burnout. 
Remember, when we continuously witness or engage with the pain, trauma, and emotional challenges of those we care for, we may begin to experience a range of symptoms associated with compassion fatigue. Um, so let's, let's explore seven practical strat strategies to help recognize these symptoms. One is physical and emotional exhaustion. We may feel constantly physically and emotionally drained as we expend significant energy and empathy in the caregiving um, role. Often, our role often involves demanding physical tasks such as lifting, assisting with mobility, and providing hands-on care. We may find ourselves constantly on our feet, attending to the needs of, of others, and performing physically strenuous activities. Moreover, the prolonged and continuous nature of caregiving can disrupt sleep patterns. <clears throat> we may experience sleep deprivation due to waking up frequently during the night to attend to the care recipient's needs. This lack of quality sleep can contribute to feelings of physical fatigue and exhaustion, making it challenging to recharge and rejuvenate. In addition to physical exhaustion, we also experience emotional exhaustion. Caregiving involves providing care, support, and empathy to individuals experiencing physical or mental challenges. We invest significant emotional energy in our role, you know, being attuned to the emotional needs and well-being of the care recipient, witnessing the suffering, pain, and struggles of those we care for can be emotionally draining. We may feel a constant sense of empathy absorbing the emotions and stress of our loved ones or clients. You know, this emotional investment and the pressure to remain compassionate and empathetic can deplete, can deplete our emotional reserves. Moreover, we often face challenging and emotionally charged situations, such as managing problematic behaviors, making tough decisions, or dealing with end-of-life care. These circumstances can further contribute to emotional exhaustion, leaving us feeling emotionally depleted and overwhelmed. So, you know, physical and emotional exhaustion can significantly impact our overall well-being. It can affect our own physical health, mental well-being, and ability to, to provide quality care. We can improve our physical well-being by addressing physical exhaustion through rest, proper nutrition, exercise, and seeking assistance. Um, <clears throat> I know, I know. We say this all the time, you know, rest, eat right, exercise, and seeking assistance, but it really does help. In my experience, some of these things go a long way, eat, you know, eating energetic foods, all of that help, taking a walk, you know, anything that can re-energize or rejuvenate us. So we're going to number two, decrease empathy. We may find it increasingly difficult to connect emotionally with others or empathize with their suffering. This emotional numbing can be a protective mechanism, but can also negatively impact the quality of care provided. You know, we can develop a sense of emotional numbing over time as we continually to provide care and support to individuals suffering or facing challenges. Emotional numbing refers to a reduced ability to experience or connect our emotions, including empathy towards others. This emotional numbing can be a defense mechanism that helps protect us from being overwhelmed by constant exposure to pain and distress. The ability to understand and share the feelings of another is a crucial aspect of caregiving. However, Due to the cumul um, cumulative na nature of compassion fatigue, we may experience empathy fatigue. It, all, it occurs when we find it increasingly difficult to connect emotionally with the individual we care for. We may struggle to fully comprehend or feel the suffering of others, 
resulting in a diminished sense of empathy. The decline in empathy can hurt our quality of care. Empathy forms the foundation for establishing solid therapeutic relationships and delivering compassionate care. When we can empathize less with the emotions and experiences of those we care for, it can affect our, our ability to understand and respond effectively to their needs. The decreased empathy associated with compassion fatigue can lead to a sense of detachment or emotional distance from the care recipients. This emotional disconnect can affect the caregiver-care recipient relationship, potentially compromising the trust and rapport vital for effective caregiving. And number three, um, increased irritability and feelings of anger. Caregivers may become more irritable, short-tempered, or experience heightened levels of frustrations and anger. The constant demand, stress, and emotional strain of caregiving can exhaust us emotionally. This exhaustion can manifest as increased irritability, impatience, and a reduced ability to handle daily stressors. We may be easily frustrated by minor inconveniences or setbacks, and they may have a shorter fuse than usual when often we often carry a significant emotional burden, witnessing the pain, suffering, and challenges faced by those we care for. This emotional overflow can build up negative emotions, including sadness, helplessness, and grief. These emotions can quickly become anger or resentment towards the situation or the care recipient, despite caregivers' genuine desire to provide compassionate care. So compassionate care can also trigger internal conflicts within caregivers. We may feel torn between our needs and the demands of caregiving, leading to guilt, frustration, and self-blame. These internal struggles, struggles sorry, can t intensify irritability and anger as we may resent ourselves or others for our sacrifices or challenges. It can significantly impact relationships, both personal and professional. We may unintentionally direct our frustration toward our loved ones, colleagues, or even the care recipient, recipient themselves. It can strain relationships and lead to interpersonal conflicts, further contributing to the caregiver's emotional distress. Experiencing increased irritability and anger does not make us a bad caregiver or person. It is a natural response to the challenges and emotional strain of caregiving. By recognizing these emotions and taking proactive steps to address them, we can improve our emotional well-being and provide care from a place of greater calm and understanding. Um, um, for me, in my in, in in my instance, you know, when I was caregiving, I remember, you know, taking my mom to the doctor's appointment. You know, I would drive her, and <clears throat> my mom has developed this habit of just flopping down in her seat, you know, um, and when you're on the outside looking in, you're like, oh, why does she keep doing that? You know, you're going to hurt yourself. You know, you're thinking all of these things, but on the inside of her, it's hard for her to bend her knees. So she just flops down in the seat. But then at the same time, it frustrates you because you're trying to catch her, you maneuvering your body in so many, um, uncomfortable positions that's not really not good for your back and then what she would do so we were in this instance we were leaving the doctor's office and I was trying to get her into the car so I'm having to shift her from the wheelchair to the car seat and she flops down in the chair and literally lays back across the driver's seat from the passenger to the driver's seat and I'm trying to get her to sit up and I keep saying mom sit up sit up and it's like she couldn't hear you, but I actually, I believe what was going on is the decline in her cognitive to understand what you were saying 
or asking her to do. And the fact that she may not could move her body in the positions that you wanted her to. She really felt in her mind that she was, but she really wasn't. And at the same time, you were frustrated and you're trying to get it in. And all I could think was, you know, and I snapped and I'm like, mom, you never listen to what I tell you to. And a couple heard me as they were walking by. And so the lady, she walks up to me and you may have heard the story, but I think it's viable with this um, this information. Um, she walked by and she held her heart and she said, would you like some help? And I was like, yes, before she could even finish. That's how frustrated I was. And <clears throat> so the lady walks over and she's having a very difficult time as well, trying to get my mother in the car and all that it took. And then the, her, um, the young man that was with her, you know, he came over to see if he could help as well. And the whole time I was feeling so bad. And then I looked at both of them. We got finally got her in and I was, you know, so grateful and I thanked them so much. And I got in the car and I apologized to my mom for step snapping at her. But it was just that in that moment of frustration, you know, um, and it wasn't her really. It was just the build up and decline you know, the decrease in her suffering that I became frustrated with her inabilities um, in, in me not being able to help her properly. So I'm saying all this to say that this stuff really happens. You know, sometimes we don't think of it, but it does. So we can move on to number four, reduce motivation and productivity. Compassion fatigue can decrease motivation and productivity and caregiving tasks. It can drain us emotionally, leaving us feeling depleted and overwhelmed. The continuous exposure, again, to pain and suffering of others, coupled with demands of caregiving, can lead to a significant decrease in motivation. We may find it challenging to um, summon the energy and drive needed to carry out our caregiving tasks effectively. The um, cumulative stress and emotional strain of caregiving can create a sense of overwhelm. We may feel like we have too much on our plate with a never ending list of responsibilities. We struggle to find a drive to tackle our tasks or face new challenges. As compassion fatigue progresses, we may experience emotional withdrawal and detachment as a protective mechanism. This detachment can result in decreased personal investment in our caregiving role. Consequently, we may lose motivation and interest in the task at hand and struggle to connect emotionally with the care recipient or find purpose in our caregiving responsibilities. Compassion fatigue can significantly impact job satisfaction or professional caregivers. The reduce, reduce motivation and productivity may lead to dissatisfaction um, with their work and a diminished sense of accomplishment. This decline in job satisfaction can further contribute to a cycle of decreased motivation as we may question the significance and value of our efforts. Um, and again, you know, Motivation and productivity may fluctuate due to compassion fatigue, which does not reflect our competence or dedication. Um, in this instance, sometimes we, we run off of a sense of duty versus compassion. Um, you know, like I used to, I used to just grapple every time I would murmur and complain every time my mom would ask me to come do something. I could just leave her side. I could say, you need anything else? I'll go sit down and try to relax. And she'll call again. And it was the constant calling after you sit down, up and down, up and down. And then I just, you know, would get frustrated. And it's like, mom, why couldn't you ask me that when I was in here? Why didn't you ask me that while I was in the kitchen? Why didn't you, you know, because they don't see or understand how much or you know how much they're they demand or or you know because 
it's like, if you can picture this, it's like you're walking for them. This is something that they normally do. This is their normal routine of walking around their own environment or their own um, personal space or, um, you know, comfort of their home. And so they can't do it. So it's like, I need you to do it. And they think of things that they want or, you know, right after the other thing. You know, even with us, we do it sometimes. We we get to, we leave the kitchen, we go sit down, we about to chill, start the television. And then we're like, oh, I forgot my fault. And we got to get up and we go back. Then we're like, oh, I need a napkin. And we got to get up and we got to go back. Well, this, the individual that we care for is experiencing the same thing, but it's your leg, so they're not feeling the impact of the overall um, demand of getting up and down, especially if you're an older individual, and even with a young person, because I remember my granddaughter, 12 years old, was getting tired of the constant calling to get up and get down. So sit down and get up and sit down and get up. So yes, um, these things does happen. Your motivation decrease, you know, you grapple, you complain, you murmur. All of this comes out of the demands of caregiving. You know, number five, sleep disturbances. We may experience difficulty with sleep, such as insomnia or nightmares due to the emotional and mental strain they endure. We endure. <clears throat> The emotional and mental stress associated with caregiving can significantly impact sleep patterns. We often bear the weight of our loved ones or clients, challenges, worries, and pain. We may constantly worry about the well-being of those we care for, making it difficult to switch off our thoughts and emotions at night. Insomnia characterized by difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or experiencing non-restorative sleep. It is a prevalent sleep disturbance among caregivers experiencing compassion fatigue. The heightened stress, worry, and emotional exhaustion can disrupt the natural sleep-wake cycle, making it challenging for um, caregivers to achieve restful and rejuvenating, rejuvenating sleep. Nightmares and disturbing dreams can manifest the emotional strain we endure. The subconscious mind may process the traumatic or distressing experiences witnessed or heard during caregiving, leading to vivid and unsettling dreams. These dreams can disrupt sleep and further contribute to sleep disturbances and feelings of unease upon waking. You know, the chronic stress and emotional strain associated with compassion fatigue can manifest physically in us. Restless leg syndrome, RLS, is characterized by an uncomfortable sensation and an irresistible urge to move the legs. Caregivers experiencing compassion fatigue may be more prone to RLS due to heightened stress levels. Additionally, muscular tensions, and um, body aches can result from the physical demands of caregiving and contribute to sleep disruptions. You know, sleep disturbances um, can have an impact on our overall well-being. Lack of quality sleep can exasperate the, um, exasperate the physical and emotional exhaustion associated with compassion fatigue, creating a cycle of sleep deprivation and decreased resilience. It can lead to difficulties with um, concentration, memory, and decision-making, further affecting our ability to provide adequate care and maintain our own health and well-being. Whew, you know, that was one of the things. Um, with me, I had a problem with staying asleep. Now, I'm so exhausted and I'm tired, I'll doze off in a minute. I'll doze off sitting up, I'll doze off um, typing on my computer, playing a game on my phone. You know, I would doze up. The problem was I could not stay asleep. So overnight, staying asleep, I would wake up, you know, to the point where, the, you know, the doctor seeking um, professional help, the doctor had to prescribe me some 
um, sleeping pills in order for me to get complete rest. Um, we do sometimes, I know in my case, we, we it, it is very difficult to turn off your thoughts, especially when you're concerned. And sometimes my thought was, did I do this? Did I do this right? I wonder, was she okay with that? Um, <clears throat> did I do a satisfactory job? Um, things that I may have said no to, I would think about, oh, well, I should do it. You know, I'm, I'm, all of this is going on in my head, you know, well, maybe tomorrow I'll go get her, let's just to say some ice cream or whatever, um, or trying to do something to make up for something where we have set boundaries or, you know, we just constantly continue to think about them and how we can care more for them. So um, as time go on, if you haven't realized it, you may realize that, you you know, once we continue to go through these, you may see some of um, these instances in yourself, which is what I'm hoping would happen so you could recognize the signs and system, um, symptoms before you hit that exhaustion level. Um, number six, let's move on to number six, feelings of guilt or shame. We may experience guilt or shame for not being able to provide enough care or support leading to self-critical thoughts and a sense of inadequacy. We often have high expectation for ourselves and may place significant pressure on our shoulders to provide the best possible care and support. We may feel, excuse me, we may feel a strong sense of responsibility for the well-being of our loved ones or clients when we think we are falling short of these expectations due to the demands and challenges of caregiving, guilt and shame can arise. You know, compassion fatigue can erode um, our confidence and self-esteem um, to feelings of inadequacy. The emotional and physical exhaustion associated with caregiving can hinder us from meeting all their needs and demands. You know, this perceived inability to, to fulfill all roles and responsibility can generate a sense of guilt and shame. We often juggle multiple roles, such as being a caregiver, a partner, a parent, or a professional. Trying to meet the demands of all these roles simultaneously can be overwhelming. You know, feeling we neglect or fall short in one area can trigger guilt or shame because we believe we are not doing enough to, you know, for everyone involved. We may struggle with the guilt or shame when setting boundaries or prioritizing our own self-care. We may feel guilty or taking care, you know, taking time for ourselves or seeking respite, you know, mistakenly believing we should always be available and self-sacrificing. It can create an internal conflict between our needs in the perceived expectations of our role. You know, compassion fatigue can lead to self-critical thoughts where we may excessively blame ourselves for um, perceived shortcomings. We may dwell on our mistakes, feeling responsible for any adverse outcomes or challenges experienced by those we care for. These self-critical thoughts contribute to guilt and shame, reinforcing our sense of inadequacy. Um, and I just gave you, you know, some of my examples, my thoughts and things that, you know, I have experienced, you know, um, thinking about how I can do more, how I can do more um, all the time. You know, um, even when I go out, you know, say I go out with a friend, which is rare, very rare. I'm thinking about, oh, you know, if we go out to dinner, maybe I'll get mom some of this, you know, or I, I'll pick up something. Or if I go run errands doing my personal shopping, I was like, oh, you know, mom need this. Maybe she'll like this. So we're constantly thinking about our care and the one that we're caring for. And we have these thoughts and it just, you know, they they become so much a part of you. Um, so let's go to <clears throat> seven, the physical um, symptoms. 
Compassion fatigue can manifest in physical symptoms such as headaches, gastrointestinal um, issues, muscle tension, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> or compromised immune system functioning. Sorry about that. My throat got dry. So um, I was laying out again how fatigue can manifest in physical symptoms such as headaches, gastrointestinal issues, muscle tension, or compromised immune system functioning. Persistent headaches um, can, be can be a common physical symptom of compassion fatigue. The stress and emotional strain we experience can lead to tension, headaches, and my or migraines. The constant pressure, worry, and responsibility associated with caregiving can contribute to developing or exasperating, exasperating these headaches. <clears throat> Compassion fatigue can affect the gastrointestinal um, system, leading to symptoms such as stomach aches, ingest, um, in, indigestion, Acid reflux or irritable bowel symbol, um, syndrome (IBS). The chronic stress and emotional turmoil we may experience can disrupt the normal functioning of the digestive system, leading to gastrointestinal discomfort or disturbances. The physical demands of caregiving and the emotional strain can result in muscle tension, tension, and body aches. We may experience tightness or stiffness in our neck, shoulders, back, or other body parts. The prolonged, prolonged periods of physical exertion, improper body mechanics, and stress-related muscle tension um, tensions can contribute to these symptoms. Compassion fatigue can compromise the functioning of the immune system, leaving us more susceptible, susceptible to um, illnesses and infections. The chronic stress and exhaustion associated with compassion fatigue can weaken the immune um, response, making us more prone to colds, flu, or other illnesses. We may experience more frequent and, frequent and prolonged illnesses or slower recovery time. <clears throat> Physical symptoms of compassion, um, compassion fatigue often include chronic fatigue and low energy levels. The continuous emotional and physical demands of caregiving, it can leave us you know, constantly drained and exhausted. Fatigue can make it challenging to carry out daily activities and may lead to a decline in, in, overall, in our overall physical activities and well-being. <clears throat> so, you know, and I give you these, you know, um, some examples, and a lot of this has come from my personal experience uh, with caregiving for um, long-term caregiving. You know, if I caught a cold, it would take me almost a month to fully recover. So that I know is true. You know, it would just linger on and linger on. Um, my energy level, yes, was was very very low. Sometimes it didn't. It was like I had to push myself, you know, to do the th do these things because you know that I had no energy. I didn't have the strength. Um, I may have mentioned in one story, you know, me and my mom we eat different types of food. She doesn't want to eat healthy, and I do. So I have to cook separate meals. And the one thing about it is like I would get up and I would fix a breakfast. And I was too tired. I did not have enough energy to then fix me something to eat after I finished her. So here we go again, neglecting my own self-care. So it can happen. And I just wanted to bring all of this out so you could recognize it and notice it. And so um, what I want to just break down is give you you know, some things <clears throat> that you can do as caregivers um, in all a part of self-care, you know, it plays a vital role in preventing and managing compassion fatigue. You know, we can incorporate various self-care strategies into our daily lives 
to prioritize our well-being. Self-care is not selfish. It is an essential component of caregiving. So here, here are some here are some things. Um, I have a list of things, and it's gonna. I'm gonna make them short. It's about 15 of some of the things that you could do and incorporate into your own life. So, number one, address address physical exhaustion through rest, proper nutrition, exercise, and seeking assistance when needed. That's that is so crucial. Number two, similarly, take steps to manage emotional exhaustion such as seeking counseling, practicing self-compassion, and engaging in activities that bring joy and relaxation can help restore your emotional balance and resilience. Then you can provide care from a place of greater calm and understanding. Number three, <clears throat> understand and address your decreased empathy of compassion fatigue and work towards Restoring your empathy and enhancing your overall well-being. Number four, implement self-care practices and seek support. You can rekindle your motivation, regain productivity, and provide compassionate care to the best of your abilities. Number five, breaking tasks into manageable steps and setting realistic goals can help alleviate overwhelming feelings, and increased motivation. Prioritizing tasks based on importance and urgency can also help regain control and focus. You're going to be the um, organized um, guru. You know, if you follow some steps, you have to plan and schedule your day and organize it. Organize your chores, your tasks, you know, meals, medication, if you organize that in, into a system, it will work well for you. Number six, establish a bedtime routine <clears throat> before bed, such as taking a warm bath, reading, or practicing relaxation techniques. It can signal the body and mind that it is time to wind down and prepare for sleep. Create a sleep-friendly environment that is dark, quiet, and cool. Number seven, engage in activities that promote stress reduction and relaxation, such as meditation, deep breathing exercises, or gentle stretching before bed. Number eight, consult healthcare professionals if sleep disturbances persist, persist and significantly affect daily functioning. Number nine, remind yourself that you are doing your best in a challenging situation. Recognize that you have limitations and that asking for help or seeking support, it's okay. It really is. Number 10, treat yourself with the same care and understanding you would extend to others. You deserve empathy and forgiveness. Number 11, set realistic expectations for yourself. Considering time, energy, and resource limitations. Focus on what is most important and accept that doing everything is ideally impossible. That's a big one. Number 12, celebrate achievements and practice gratitude for the positive impact you are making in the lives of others and your role as a caregiver. Number 13, prioritize a balanced diet, regular exercise, and sufficient sleep to support your physical health and strengthen your immune system. Now, when we talk about diet, we're not necessarily talking about you going on a diet to lose weight, but you might want to eat some things that will bring you energy, your proteins, or what your um, high level vitamins, whatever you need that's going to help support your body and, and your um, mental functioning. <clears throat> Number 14, pay attention to your body mechanics and ergonomic practices. Remember the car situation when physically caregiving to help minimize the risk of muscle tension, um, tension, back aches, body aches, and physical discomfort. 
And number 15, build a support network of family, friends, or professional caregivers. It can lighten the load and reduce physical strain. So now we're moving into our actionable steps. And these actionable steps are actually a recap of everything that we learned. But they're pulling out some of the most important things. Number one, make self-care a priority. Set aside dedicated time for self-care activities. Practice self-compassion and permit yourself to rest. And establish healthy boundaries to, to protect your needs. Self-care is essential for combating compassion fatigue. It would be best to prioritize your well-being to maintain your physical and emotional and mental health. Number two, seek support and connection. Join a caregiver support group or online communities to connect with others who share similar experiences and can offer empathy and understanding. Contact friends, family, or professionals to discuss your feelings and seek emotional support. Consider seeking therapy or counseling to explore and process your caregiving related emotions. Building a support network and seeking connections with others who understand the challenges of caregiving can provide invaluable support. This is one of the things that I did. I sought um, professional help. Um, I also had a couple of best friends that would just listen to me vent, you know, getting it, my frustration out, you know, family. It does work. It does help, in other words. You know, number three, practice stress reduction techniques. Incorporate relaxation um, techniques into your daily routine. Engage in physical activities that promote stress reduction or explore creative outlets, such as journaling, art, or music as a means of self-expression and stress relief. Managing stress is crucial for addressing compassion fatigue. Implementing stress reduction techniques can help us relax, restore energy, and build resilience. Um, like I always said, my thing was getting up early, spending time just me and God, music, writing, all of the above, it all helped as well for me to maintain at a, a certain level. <clears throat> you know, by taking these actionable steps, you can proactively address compassion fatigue, prioritize your well-being, and enhance your ability to provide adequate care while maintaining your health and resilience. So, reflection time. Reflection, let's reflect on addressing compassion fatigue. Number one, this motivational quote is by Eleanor Brown, in, who said, Self-care is not selfish. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. Yes, that is a whole lot to think about. Our inspirational reflection comes from Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 that says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. As we wrap up <clears throat> this episode, compassion fatigue is indeed a real and significant issue that caregivers face, but it is not an insurmountable challenge. Throughout this podcast, we have explored the signs, impacts, and actionable steps to address compassion fatigue. By recognizing the signs and symptoms, caregivers have taken a crucial step in reclaiming their well-being. Remember, self-care is not a luxury, but a necessity in the caregiving journal journey. Through self-reflection and implementing strategies tailored to your unique needs, you can navigate the demanding nature of your role while safeguarding your own well-being. Caring for yourself is just as important as caring for others. This concludes this segment of Caregiver Chronicles Unveil, Addressing Compassion Fatigue. I am Doc Steph, your host and your host with Let's Heal Together. We hope you found our discussion on compassion fatigue insightful and empowering. Furthermore, 
We hope this podcast has provided valuable insight, support, and encouragement to caregivers who tirelessly dedicate themselves to the well-being of others. Remember, you are not alone on this journey. Reach out, seek support, and remember that your well-being matters. Together, we can support one another and create a culture of care that extends to those we serve in ourselves. If you found value value in our discussion, I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, like this episode, and leave a comment. Your feedback is invaluable and helps us create content that resonates with you. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, stay well, take care, replenish your heart, and continue healing together. Peace and blessing. Thank you.